we be well. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for everything you give us. Lord, we give a little bit back because we try to be obedient. We practice our obedience. So we give a little bit back. In your name. Amen. So, uh, I have today's. I didn't. I got it out late. So. If you want one, raise your hand. I'll bring it to you. All right. I was a little busy. Over here. here. Come. Oh. Bob, you don't know how to reach. I'll give you. different ages and we move it around but if I were to ask you what's the perfect age for God to use you if you are uh, young if you're a teenager you're like well not yet I don't know anything yet I'm, I'm too young I haven't experienced enough if you're of the older crowd you're like well I think I'm too old and if you're the, the middle age like me, you're like, I just need a little bit more experience. Young people are too careless. And old people are too careful. 
<laughs> Young people don't think. But old people think too much. <laughs> look, look at our country. Like it takes forever to pass anything to, to because everybody's got to think about it. And, and young people are like, yeah, just do it. So, old people, we want to use. No, I'm not old. You guys want to use <laughs> all of our experience to make a decision. And young people are like, yeah, let's try it. Right? So, they're careless, we're too careful. Now, I'm going to bring up some ages to you guys, and I hope, I hope that it just blows your mind. So the best estimation on age was that Cain was 15 years old when he killed his brother Abel. One five. That's a little bit tough to think about, right? Okay. So that's a very negative side. Best estimation is that David was somewhere between the age of 13 and 15 when he killed Goliath. Jesus was approximately 12 when his mom couldn't find him and he was back in the temple teaching. Now I did this kind of a, a survey. We had about 20 kids at a youth group one day, and you know the, the, the large array of ages were at youth group that day. So we had Susana, who was 10, um, and Sasadia, who's 17, and everybody in between. And I said, we were talking about sin, and the understanding of sin, and I said, you know, at what point do you understand sin? And nobody could really put, put their finger on it. So I said, let's break it down. Now the reason I'm giving you guys this, this example is because 10 to 17 was a long time ago for some of you. And so, <laughs> and even for me, it's this, it's this, you know, when you're kids, we think of now, right? We think of now a lot when we were kids. Uh, we can't remember that, but we do remember getting in trouble for thinking that way. So I was able to ask the 17-year-old, do you know what sin is? Yes. The 10-year-old, do you know what sin is? Mm -hmm. So we take that as a no. So then I started creeping in. 16. Yeah. I think we jumped to 12. And that was, I don't know. So we take that kind of as a no, right? 15, yeah. 13. Mm -hmm. So we're like, okay. And they're like, yeah, maybe, kinda. And then we get to 14, and they're like, yeah. And then another one's like, yeah, kinda. And then, so, the age, I mean, the kids figured it out, right? We struggle with it. The Bible tells us it's around 13 or 14. They figured it out. I mean, so, that's an understanding that I think us as adults either don't give enough credit or give too much credit. If you think that your 12-year-old knows the decisions that they are making, you're giving them far too much credit. But then again, if you give your 17-year-old, well, the benefit of the doubt, maybe he doesn't know what he's doing. Yes, they do. Okay? So it's this understanding, and then as we apply it back to Cain, 15, uh, David, 13 to 15. So now I'm going to give you guys some other dates. Jesus was about 30 when he turned water into wine. So his first miracle. David was about 30 when he became king. They actually say he was 30. But if you're 29 and, you know... 
and almost 30, they're going to call you 30. So we just say about 30. Elisha was 30 when he was called by Elijah. And then Timothy was 21 when he was called by Paul and about 30 when he took over the church in Ephesus. So you have this beginning of God's calling at teenage years, and then you have the 30-year-olds, like me. <laughs> Abraham was 100 years old. When Isaac was born. Moses was 40 years old when he spoke to God in the burning bush. And he was 80 when he led the Israelites out of Exodus and when he began talking to Pharaoh. Ruth was 40. Her husband had died, and it, she was 40 when she gave birth to the new line. So when she married Boaz, she was 40. And that line is the line that created the way for Jesus. And it follows all the way back to Abraham. So, I say again, age is just a number. At what age will God call you? You might be a hundred. So now, what's the other thing you say? Well, I'm not ready, right? I'm not prepared, I'm not equipped. Let's go to Exodus chapter four. So we think of Moses, right? Moses was a young Hebrew Egyptian prince. <laughs> Pretty weird. But in those days, if you guys would think about Moses, he, the only way he could really be educated is if he were royalty or Egyptian. And um, because he was Egyptian, he had a lot of training that ended up helping the Israelites out. So we got to figure this was perfect for him, to, for everything to happen the way it did. And so Moses has already talked to the burning bush. And here he is about 80 years old. At 80 years old, you'd think that, like, he's pretty obedient, he's very wise, he's not going to fight with God, he's going to be a good little boy. <laughs> so, Exodus 4. Then Moses answered, but suppose they do not believe me or listen to me, but say, the Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw the staff on the ground and it became a snake. And Moses drew back from it. <laughs> we could have just taken that. We can't remove it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and seize it by the tail. So he reached out his hand and grasped it. And it became a staff in his hand. I'm going to go to my Bible. I can't do this. Next slide. So that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. 
He put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, his hand was leprous, as white as snow. Then God said, put your hand back into your cloak. So he put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his body. I have a quick question. Did anybody remember that part of the story? <laughs> no, why? I'll tell you why. You'll see why. Next part. Verse 8. If they will not believe you or heed the first sign, they may believe the second sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or heed you, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor, in, nor even now that you have spoken to your servant. But I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And the Lord said to him, who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. So God is trying to tell him, even though you have a speech impediment, even though the world says, you are AB normal, right? You're not like the rest of us. You are slow to learn or whatever. God says, I'm going to use you and I'm going to give you everything you need to get your message across. Because you're, he's going to be doing his work. But Moses the obedient says... Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, What of your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know that he can speak fluently. Even now he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, his heart will be glad. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and, wish, and with his mouth, and will teach you what you shall do. He indeed shall speak for you to the people. He shall serve as a mouth for you, and you shall serve as God for him. Take in your hand the staff with which you shall perform the signs. So we take that and we apply it to when God will call us or when you've been called. And what's our argument? I'm too young. I'm too old. I don't have enough experience. I don't have the equipment that you need me to go do. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a youth pastor. I don't want to go. We say, God show up in this place and use this church. And then he's like, okay, go to the prison. And I'm like, nope. <laughs> Right? That's what we do. We're like, well, wait a minute. You know my heart and you know that I really did not want to go to prison. You could have sent me somewhere else. Moses, you know, we, we, we say, man, if we could just see a sign, a sign. I mean, a sign that is without a shadow of a doubt, God. Tell me, do you think that you have more faith than Moses? Because Moses literally saw a sign, heard the audible voice of God telling him step by step what to do, and still he didn't believe. Still he was a little bit resilient. Let's go to Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. 
When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet. And rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourself. And after that you may pass on. Since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour. Knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to, to the herd and took a calf, tender and good. And gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season. And your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old, and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh, yes, you did laugh. Then the men set out. Is that where I stop? Yep. That's where I want to stop. So, we think, all right, at what age, right? Maybe when we're 90, we will start to be obedient. Or maybe when we're 90, we have enough wisdom where we can finally serve God. But even then, they weren't ready. Even then, when they were called, they held back a little bit. They were not as trusting as you would think that these believers would be. Again, they are sitting with God. Go to Kings now. Sorry, I'm going to get there in my Bible. What do you think of the new backdrop? Again, so here's the the older group, and they're like, "Well, now I'm too old. If I had this experience in the body of a 17 year old, I could do so much work for God. I could get it done, right? My lung capacity, the the desire to just outprove everybody, but that's not the way it works." You can't have the wisdom and the youth. Second right. Kings chapter two. And if you want a good read, Second Kings is a good read. It reads like a story. There's lots of gore in it. It's pretty cool. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, that'll be important later, 
Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho, the company of prophets, who were at Jericho, drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went, and stood at some distance from them. As they both were standing by the Jordan, then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. Does anybody remember that happening? <laughs> when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elisha ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen but when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. When the company of prophets who were at Jericho saw him at a distance, they declared, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. They came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. They said to him, See now, we have fifty strong men among your servants. Please let them go and seek your master. It may be that the spirit of the Lord has caught him up and thrown him down on some mountain or into some valley. He responded, No. Do not send them. But when they urged him until he was ashamed, he said, send them. So they sent 50 men who searched for three days, but did not find him. When they came back to him, he had remained at Jericho. He said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? Now the people of the city said to Elisha, the location of this city is good, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad, and the land is unfruitful. He said, bring me a new bowl. And put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went to the spring of water. And threw the salt into it. And said. Thus says the Lord. I have made this water wholesome from now on. Neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been wholesome to this day. According to the word that Elisha spoke. He went up from there to Bethel. And while he was going up on the way. Some small boys came out of the city. And jeered at him, saying, Go away, bald head! Go away, bald head! When he turned around and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two she bears came out of the woods and mauled forty two of the boys. From there he went on to Mount Carmel and then returned to Samaria. Told you to get gruesome. <laughs> <clears throat> but you see, you have somebody who is being obedient. Now, Elisha is set apart from 
like everybody, right? Some of the things he does, when Jesus comes, Jesus did those very same things. We just forget about Elisha. Elisha resurrected a kid from the dead. And you can find that in 2 Kings. I urge you to read it. Now, it's not an age thing. It's an obedient thing. Elisha is roughly about 30 years old, but he was trained by Elijah. And he saw God work in Elijah. So when it came time, he just had this belief and this obedience. Now we're going to go back to 1 Samuel 17. Now here we go again. This is an, an obedience lesson, and it's an age lesson. So we know the story of Abraham, who was, he finally came into the love and understood the calling of God when he became obedient, when God said, go sacrifice your son. And he went and he put his son up on the altar. And we have this story of David. And the amount of obedience that comes from somebody we would not think would react that way or act that way. First Samuel verse 17. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They were gathered at Sopa, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sopa and Azekah. In Ephesus, Damon, Saul, that's King Saul, and the Israelites gathered and encamped in the valley of Ella and formed ranks against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them, and there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of God whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze in his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three eldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. The names of the th his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For forty days the Philistine came forward and took his strand, morning and evening. Jesse said to his son David, Take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of, the, of their thousand. See how your brothers fare and bring some token from them. Now Saul... And they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of El, fighting with the Philistines. 
David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, took the provisions, and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the encampment as the army was going forth to the battle line, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle army against army. David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, ran to the ranks, and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath, by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, and David heard him. All the Israelites, when they saw the man, fled from him and were very much afraid. The Israelites said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. The king will greatly enrich the man who kills him and will give him his daughter and make his family free in Israel. David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The people answered him in the same way, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. His eldest brother Eliab heard him talking to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. He said, Why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down just to see the battle. David said, What have I done now? It was only a question. He turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. So you guys can picture this, right? You have the three older brothers getting ready for war, but also shaking in their boots. Why are they shaking in their boots? they're thinking too much. They're overthinking it. Why is David not shaking in his boots? Because he's not thinking. It's just very simple. So God called him at a time when somebody who doesn't think versus when people are overthinking. The, the, some of the, you know, the greatest minds are older people, right? But some of the best doers are young people. So as he's walking up, I mean, I can picture it. I can picture, I, I picture like David, little David, walking up and annoying heaven, you know, and heaven's like, what are you doing here? Get out of here. Go back to that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it happens with our kids. And Susanna will go up to Lorelai and Lorelai's like, get out of here. I don't want to talk to you. He turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul. Sent for David said to Saul, Let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it. And struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul 
clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David straps all sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the water and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand and drew and he drew near to the Philistine. So, I'll paint you another picture. <coughs> he it wasn't that Saul's sword was too big. It wasn't that Saul's armor was too big. It's that he was uncomfortable. So now we have a picture of the size of David. We also know that Saul was a pretty big uh, human being. So, I mean, everybody's big to me, but um, Saul, amongst the Israelites, was a warrior, uh, set apart, good looking. And uh, so David is just probably a little bit smaller than he is. Philistine. Oh, that was the other thing I want to talk about. Isn't it interesting that so the one person that goes up against Goliath, if that person loses, the the entire Israelite army loses. Right? Isn't it weird that they would go ahead and put all their faith in this little kid? Again, that is God. Just ordaining this and you have people being obedient. And 41. The Philistine came. Sorry. The Philistine came on and drew near to David. With his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David. He disdained him. For he was only a youth. Ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David. Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down, and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the, battles, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone striking down the Philistine and killing him. There was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine. He grasped his sword, drew it out of his sheath, and killed him. Then he cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. The troops of Israel and Judah rose up with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath. And the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sharaim as far as Gath and Ekron. The Israelites came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. He put his armor in his tent. When Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this young man? Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I do not know. The king said, Inquire whose son. 
the stripling is. On David's return from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Bethlehemite. Interesting that I mean, there's I won't say it, but in the in the media, there's a big conversation of what's evil, right? Well, here we have a rock that was used for evil, and the same rock or a different rock was used for good. So it's the person, not the rock. Just I'll just throw that out there. But uh, <laughs> but God used an obedient person. That's it. Age didn't matter. We talk about serving. We talk about what can God do in our lives? When will he do it? And if you ask us, we'll never be ready. We will never be ready. Just we're going to have as many excuses like Moses. Moses, after seeing the signs, we've seen signs when you were called to do something. You've seen signs. You've had doors closed right on your face. And still we say, I need another sign. We go back to Gideon. I need another sign. But I'm. We can't focus on age. Because you might be 90 and God's going to say it's time for you to have a baby. <laughs> or you might be 100. And Interesting. We think that 100 is old. After Sarai died. Abraham married somebody else and had more kids. Just, just saying. Age is just a number. Whether you're young or you're old or you're 39 years old. <laughs> That's the actual. Being obedient is the key. Trusting God is the key. Uh, if you want to study these four, you know, uh, spots in the Bible, again, it's just taking, and there are more about this age thing that we focus so much on, but God does not. God focuses and will use obedience over age. You're never the perfect age. Father God Almighty, Lord, I just give thanks and praise for for who you are, Lord, for the work that you're doing in this church, Lord, for your message. I ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds to be able to understand these words that we're reading. Uh, I ask for a blessing over this church. And uh, as we go out this week, give us courage and strength to follow you, Lord, to seek you and to tell others about you. We ask this in the name of your son. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.